On a quiet, quintessentially rural road just outside Owen Sound, you can find one of the most vandalized and stolen roadsides in Ontario. It's understandable, because the name of the road includes a word that is problematic for many people. It is called Negro Creek Road. And it's kept that name in large part thanks to concerted efforts by descendants of the black pioneers who settled the area. Let's find out more with, in the nation's capital, Georgina Alonzo. She's a PhD candidate at the University of Ottawa's School of International Development and Global Studies. In Burlington, Ontario, Dennis Scott, chair of the Halton Black History Awareness Society. And here in our studio, Rob Green, singer-songwriter who is a descendant of the residents of the community around the road in question. And it's great to have you three with us. Uh, Rob, you here in the studio, and Dennis and Georgina in Points Beyond. Great to have you on our program. Uh, Dennis, I want to start with you. You grew up in Owen Sound, eighth generation Canadian. What is your family's connection to the so-called Negro Creek community? We have relatives from there. Um, the Earls, Woods, and Bowie's um, all uh, settled there before going to Owen Sound. Um, and Owen Sound is the uh, mecca of the Underground Railroad, the last terminus. And um, my eight generations were growing up in Shallow Lake in um, this particular area as well as the Owen Sound area. So if you're eighth generation, when did your earliest descendants arrive in that area? It was around 1815. 1815, terrific, okay. Georgina, in your judgment, what is this dispute about? Yeah, I think the dispute is about um, whether or not to keep the road signs uh, as they are or whether we should be renaming them. I think for some, as you said, the word Negro presents a, a problematic aspect, but um, since the descendants of the area are calling for this to be kept and, um, it, you know, to preserve the black history of the area, I think that we should be trusting them to, to know that this is the right thing to do. I myself am not a descendant of the area, but I grew up there. And you endorse the idea to keep the name as it was? Yeah, I do. And Dennis, how about you? Oh, absolutely. It's part of our history, our heritage. Um, and uh, even though you got the word Negro in there, we were called Negroes. So let's uh, talk about true history and promote it and prevent and preserve it. Okay, Rob Green, where are you on this issue? I am totally in agreement with them. I'd like to keep the name as well. Because? You know, because it, uh, it's a um, historical land site. It's a historical monument. It's historical. And I think uh, my descendants uh, or my ancestors that live there, uh, they deserve that right. Tell us about that. You have direct descendants from yes, the area? Yes, uh, Dennis and I are cousins, by the way. We're, we're, I don't think I knew that, yeah, actually. Oh, well done. We're, we're both cousins, yeah. yeah. Okay. We talk Hi, quite, quite often. <laughs> Hi, Dennis. <laughs> uh -huh. um, I, um, I have descendants there as well, but I'm fifth generation Canadian. Hmm. Yeah, Dennis's family goes back a little bit further than mine. And you're a musician, right? I am a musician. So how'd you get involved in this history thing? Well, um, I was a drama teacher for 37 years at, Where? at school, at uh, Salfley High School in Hamilton. And so after I graduated uh, after, from teaching, I wanted to do music. Uh, that was always my dream. And so I started writing music. And my cousin, who's the, uh, one of the uh, workers at Ontario Black History Society, she said, Rob, do you want to do a, uh, a show for me? And I said, so sure, I'll do a show for you. I, so I started putting together a, a show about my ancestors. Hmm. And uh, I did it in New York, I did it in Warrington University and, and all around. And then, I, and then I found out that I did it up in West Gray for Ben, and that's where I, I met Ben Hayward, uh, you know. And he was really good, uh, really good to me and uh, asked me if I wanted to join the Negro Creek community, so I did. Okay, well, but tell us this, you know, people in this province have been told for many decades that that's a word you don't use anymore. So what's the argument to suggest that it's okay to use it in this context? Well, um, my argument was, don't we use the word Caucasian? Yeah, but ca uh, Caucasian does not have the same connotation and the same pejorative interpretation yeah, as Negro it's, does. But it's, a still, it's still same. It's an it's a, uh, ethnicity, and Negro is fine for me. I am a Negro, and I am also Caucasian, so I'm both. Dennis, would you say that today? Would you would you describe yourself that way, using that word today? Oh, absolutely. 
um, I have no problem with that at all. I think one of the things to appreciate too, um, and why I had uh, a comfort growing up in the area of the eight generations, I had a young lady stand up and said, uh, of all the eight uh, cultures that you belong to, um, which culture do you lean towards the most? And I said, Dennis Scott, which uh, <laughs> opened my eyes in regards to, you know, we have to be, uh, preserve ourselves and know ourselves to the best of our ability to be able to carry our history on to the younger generations and the likes of that. So I have no problem whatsoever in regards to the word Negro. I'm a Negro. It's like Caucasian, as Rob said, no if buts or ands. And um, there's nothing wrong with uh, communicating in regards to the Blacks being Negro. And we're also very multicultural. Well, let's see what Georgina thinks about that, because she's not from the same, I hate to tell you two, she's not from the same generation as you two. And we'll see if she has the same view. Georgina, would you, would you have a problem with people describing you or describing yourself as a Negro? Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't choose that word myself. I'm mixed race. My my dad is black and my mom is white. Um, and I think that that word does have a problematic uh, history and is problematic in certain contexts. I think that it depends how the word is being used. But in this particular case, um, the, the Negro Creek Road sign is really the only indicator of the history of the area. And that's what we've come together around is the history of the Negro Creek community. And so I think it's completely appropriate to use in this case. And, you know, I respect um, the people that I've gotten to know through this work who are descendants from the area who say that they want to keep that name. I think um, when we're when we're trying to change things to be more inclusive and more appropriate, um, we should be listening to the people who are actually affected by this. And if, if they're saying that this is what they want to use, then we should be using this word. Okay, we're going to come back to that in a second. But uh, Dennis, let me get you in on this. You chair the Black, the uh, Halton Black History Awareness Society. Give us a sense yes. about the kind of work that you do there. We do a lot of work in regards to anti-racism, um, teaching Black history. Um, it wasn't until 20 that I realized I was not taught my Black history. So it's very important to our culture and our heritage in regards to passing our knowledge uh, along. Um, I also, uh, we're also involved in regards to uh, developing the culture in the Halton area, which was once called White Halton, uh, to the point of uh, getting culture's recognition as a culture capital of Canada, much as I did in the Owen Sound area. And, and lastly is because um, we are looking at history. A lot of the history has either been thrown under the rug, not documented, and or is being changed. And it's very important for us to keep our history so we as Blacks know it, number one, and we can communicate that to the diversity of people that we have coming into the area. And one latter point is Holton is the fastest growing visible minority region in all of Canada. So it's very important for us to be ahead of the game for all our new uh, individuals who are coming in who are visible minorities. I must confess, having lived in Southern Ontario my entire life, I have never heard of Holton referred to ever as White Holton. What's the mm. history there? My belief is that's the way it was, basically, because it was uh, predominantly British and European, white European. And there wasn't a lot of communication in regards to the Blacks who came into this particular area. We have all kinds of history in regards to um, Eastern Eastern um, Halton, uh, going to Toronto and beyond. We have all kinds of information from Hamilton going west and very little information in regards to Halton. Historians around this area and in this area have told me the history of Blacks in Halton is lacking. And so it's very important for us to uncover it, research it, and document it, and promote it. Understood. Rob, community leaders have been pe petitioning for something else in the area as well, namely a stone monument yes. as a memorial to the original black pioneers right. who settled the area. Yes. You're involved in those efforts. How's that going? It's passed. It's passed. So we, what happens we, now? We had a town council meeting last week, and the town council uh, under Mayor Mackey, just amazing, uh, warm-hearted uh, celebration. It was a celebration, actually. Uh, so what happened was they passed it, and uh, what we we're going to do is we're going to uh, get a, uh, a rock. We've already got the rock. We're going to uh, designate a place where to put it, 
uh, we're going to work with the town council to find an area to do that. And we're, and we're talking in Owen Sound or where? No, no, it'll be on Nico Creek Road, somewhere in that area. Okay. Uh, close to the area. And uh, it'll be visible from the highway so that people can stop and, and, and uh, visit as a historic landmark. And uh, it's going to it's going to be really, really good. It's going to work. It's going to work. What's it going to say or what's it going to look like? Well, they're, we're going to work on the lettering together, the, the, the names and what we're going to be saying. And also, um, Ben suggested one of the, Ben Hayward, he was one of the uh, founders of the, of the group. He suggested we put the people's names, all the people's names that were uh, the original pioneers. And how many the, names would that be? Well, there was 10 families and, uh, in that area. I, there was 11, but they reduced it to 10. And they're going to put those pe people's names in the, in the rock. That feels like the right thing to do for you? Yes. Yes. I, one, of the, one of my appeals was, when I, when I actually went, went and did the proposal to them, one of my appeals was the fact that I am, I am part of that land. My uh, grandmother, uh, my, my, actually my mother who passed away, she, she's in Mount Zion Cemetery, Cemetery, which is just up the road. My grandmother, she's in Mount Zion Cemetery. And my great-grandmother, she's in Mount Zion Cemetery. Hmm. So, and they were mm, the Earlses and the Bowies and that sort of thing. So I'm really connected to the, to the land. And uh, I see this as a, as in a remarkable thing for uh, people to do and, and sort of like uh, working together. Georgina, I want to read an excerpt from something that you wrote. This is an article you did for a magazine called the Briar Patch Magazine. And here we go. You write, it's true that most black people in Canada live in cities. In 2016, 94.3% of black Canadians lived in the country's census metropolitan areas, in comparison to 71% of Canada's total population. But plenty also call rural Canada home, and even more have important ties to these spaces. When we fail to talk about rural black Canadians, we contribute to the erasure of black history, present and future. That's a, that's a really interesting point, because I guess in your travels you have discovered that when people think of the African-Canadian community or the black communities in this country, we think urban Canada, we don't think rural Canada. We need to change mm -hmm. that in your view? Yeah, I mean, I think that in all the discussions in the past uh, few years about removing racist monuments or monuments that are celebrating um, people who contributed to racist legacies in this country, the other side of that is that we need to have um, monuments to recognize the history that's been erased. And that's what this monument at Negro Creek would do. Um, I think that for me personally, as someone who moved to the area when I was 10 years old as a mixed race person and didn't feel um, any type of connection to the area, I felt very much like an outsider um, just based on my race alone, uh, among other things. But but focusing on the race, I mean, um, it was it would have been really meaningful to know about this history and to be able to make the connections that I've made through doing this work with, with Rob and now Dennis and other uh, descendants from the area to understand that that history is much deeper and that there is a place of belonging for, for all of us. Dennis, tell us what your biggest concern is as it relates to what Georgina has just described as the erasure of black history in the area. Oh, we, we hear about it all the time, especially in America, where they're trying to get black history out of the history books. And that's a no-go as far as I'm concerned. The area that we're talking about, there's a story about Priceville, where basically the community tried to rid any knowledge of blacks living there, even to the point of changing census from uh, being black to Irish or Scottish. And it's very much the same as this uh, um, old uh, Negro Creek Road as to getting rid of it. Um, I'm proud to say I knew the individual who got a committee around to preserve Pr uh, Pr Priceville uh, Cemetery, and now it's a heritage site of Canada. Um, 
and tombstones were dug up from potato fields, people's homes, and baseball diamonds in order to appreciate the fact that Blacks did live there and they had quite a lot of heritage. And I've been told as well that every 60 acres along Highway 6 used to be owned by Blacks at one time. But unfortunately, they got all got pushed out because of tax changes and ownership changes and the likes of that. So we have a big heritage there, which is unseen at this particular point. It's very important for us to make sure it's acknowledged and appreciated and remembered. And Georgina, what would you say? I mean, obviously, racism is, is an issue wherever you live in this country. Uh, but it is not unusual to see black faces in the bigger cities of this country. It is more unusual uh, to see black faces in rural Ontario. Are there special kinds of discriminatory problems in rural Ontario or Canada that you don't see in the big cities? I think just that that sense of um, it not being a space for for other people who are not white really contributes to a mentality in which policies that um, are racist and that exclude others are able to thrive and that that itself is quite a problem. There's also this idea of um, rural Canada being a very uh, polite place, like we love our, to talk about our Canadian identity as saying sorry too much and being overly polite, and that kind of um, reduces the um, experiences of us, of those of us that grew up in in rural Canada that uh, don't have that politeness. There's there's this undertone of um, of hatred or or just yeah, not not belonging. Is that right? I should ask Rob about that as well. Is there it, I mean, the expression used was an undertone of, of hate in that area, in those areas. Is that, is that something, is that part of the legacy here? I think, I think growing up in Owen Sound, I, I felt that to, to some extent, there was a certain amount of racism, uh, undertone of racism there. Uh, there was, um, but there was, there was a, a general getting along with each other. There was general, you know, com uh, completeness of, of, of Owen Sound and the people there, they, were, they, were, they worked together for the most part. My father, he was a mailman. He was probably one of the first mailmans in, in uh, Canada. But, uh, and I went to school in West Hill and um, Dennis actually was the head boy of uh, his high school and his sister as well, and his aunt as well. And uh, at West Hill High School, Blaine Courtney, who is a descendant also of, uh, of the uh, Original Courtney, Jay Courtney's family, he became head boy, and so yeah, there was there was, but you know, I think there was a general um, a general feeling of let's get along, let's try to be together, let's work together in in uh, in uh, Owen Sound. But I found when I moved to the city, it was whew, I could let go because there was a lot more black people and, and various other people there. So I let go and I, I really enjoyed that that particular aspect of it. Felt more at home in the bigger city. Yeah, more at home and, and you know, you sort of lose, you sort of lose yourself. But you, it, just a little story, when I was a kid and my mother would take us down to Owen Sound to uh, buy shoes or buy school supplies or whatever. It was like, you know, mother, mother hand leading the, the ducks down the road. <laughs> uh, when we walked by certain houses, people's heads would turn. And I, as a kid, I didn't think too much of it, but in retrospect, yeah. Why do you think the heads turned? Because we're black. They didn't see too many black people or black families. You stood out more for yeah, that reason. Yeah, we stood out. Yeah. Hmm. You know, Dennis, we, we covered the Priceville story uh, on this program, I think last year or the year before, I can't remember now. But we, we did cover it. We had some guests on. We had a discussion about it. And one of the things we learned is that some of the greatest allies that the black communities had into re-establishing that history and making sure it was known uh, that, um, you know, black people did live in rural Ontario once upon a time in, um, in pioneering numbers. Um, some of the biggest allies you had were white people. Is that the case with this issue as well? No, if buts or ands. Um, the fact that I have white in my blood too, it's very important for me to appreciate that I'm multicultured. Um, and not only black, I'm of different uh, cultures. Um, also, the, for instance, uh, there were white individuals such as Les McKinnon, who's the individual who turned around Priceville and got heritage recognition. 
uh, there is Captain Orn, who Orn Sound is named after, okay? And he um, is one of the first abolitionists recorded in history, going down to Africa through the British government and going in to talk to tribes about not selling people from other tribes. Um, Orn Sound has a rich history in Markdale, just around the corner from Priceville. Um, the only white person killed by the Ku Klux Klan, that's where he came from, when he went down to teach blacks um, how to read and write. So the history is really rich in their own sound area. At the turn of the 18th century, 10% of the population were black. Um, but a lot of the rural individuals we didn't know about, especially myself, I wasn't old enough at that time. But the rural individuals, I mean, because he was so isolated and remote, um, it wasn't aware all the time of their being a lot of blacks in the area. So it's a it's an aspect of recognizing our history, promoting it, and moving it on. I think one other aspect, um, it's headspace as well. We've always been told what to think and how to think. So uh, um, colony individuals um, could negate us and have us working against each other. Um, and it isn't a it isn't appropriate in regards to um, communicating, and that's why we don't know our history, because our elders would not communicate about our Black history for fear of reprisal. Mm -hmm. So that's another reason why there isn't a lot of communication or knowledge about Blacks in the rural area. One last thing is um, Queen's Bush, all the way from Waterloo up to Lake Huron, okay? That was predominantly raised by Blacks, okay? But they were pushed out of their particular centers as well. So it's very much like Priceville over and over again. So that's why it's even more important to keep that name, Old Negro Creek Road. Okay. Georgina, where specifically did you grow up? I grew up in Flesherton, Ontario. So it's, um, it's just a little ways from the Pioneer the Durham Road Pioneer Cemetery that uh, that Dennis was talking about. Okay, now you've told us you're mixed race, uh, one parent white, one parent black. Um, I, I wonder if the experiences that you've heard from these two gentlemen about what it was like to grow up black at the times in which they did, does that have echoes for you as well? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I didn't mean to say before that, that every white person is seething with hatred, uh, you know, under their breath. Um, but that, that that's some, certainly a, something that's present that that you feel occasionally, not all the time. Um, but that yes, it's in, it's important too to have uh, white allies working together with us on this issue, and and that's something that I experienced as well growing okay. up there. Dennis, let me get back to you. I'd like you to follow up on something that Rob said. He described what it was like growing up for him and the heads that were turning. Uh, you were eighth generation in your area growing up in the 50s and 60s near Owen Sound. And I, you know, I wonder if you shared, if you experienced similar things uh, to Rob, heads turning, that kind of thing. To be candid, no. Um, and I think the reason for that was because um, our family just promoted us to be the best person we possibly could be. So I sometimes uh, laugh at the fact I may have not even known I was black until grade 13. And that's when I first recognized prejudice, which was in the school system, which um, basically um, pushed me to ask for consultation in regards to alleviating that particular problem. Um, Just know. fill in the blanks there, if you would. What, what happened in grade 13 that made you realize you were black? I was going with this woman who was white, and basically after three years of going out together, her father said we couldn't go out together anymore, and that's from his army parties and all that kind of stuff. So I was virtually kicked out of the home and going there and disassociated with that particular woman. But it was a traumatic experience, and I asked for counseling when I went to my first year of university, and it was a minister uh, who basically took me out of my negative attitude in regards to what I had just experienced and carried me on. I think one of the most important thing about people, and especially students, is the fact that they feel they're loved, number one, and two, that they are important. And not, a lot, not enough of them are taught that. And by teaching their history, um, they're gonna find a lot of positive things. For instance, I didn't know my aunt, who's my sister's, uh, my mother's sister, was the first black or one of the first black Negro um, nurses graduating in Canada. 
And that's after being kicked out of every other school, not kicked out, but um, not allowed to go in any other school in the Ontario area. So I have experienced prejudice. I didn't to realize my black history until 1970 in my 20s. And I dedicated myself in regards to promoting our history and finding out more history so that we know who we are and where we came from and where we potentially can go. Marvelous. Uh, Rob, in our last couple of minutes here, maybe you could weigh in on that. I know, uh, you know, we would all love, those of us who put these programs all, we would all love people to know more about everything. Mm -hmm. This being Black History Month, one of the things we would like people to know more about is black history. In your view, if there's one thing that you think we ought to know about as it relates to black history in Ontario that you think people don't know today, what might it be? I think uh, the one thing I would talk about is, is the divisiveness among the black community itself. Within the community? Within the community. There seems to be a lot of people that are um, in organizations, black organizations, they're so divided against each other. There's, it's almost like a competitive spirit. Divided like, over what? Over, um, you know, doing black history presentations, doing, doing shows, doing festivals, that sort of thing. And uh, so they're, they're, they're all divided. And, and uh, you know, I'm a member of the, I'm on the board of the Ontario Black History Society. And one of the things that I would like to see is unity, causing unity within all these organizations. Who would be opposed to, to increasing the amount of black history we learn or the way we learn it? Who would be opposed? Yeah. I think somewhere, I think some people are opposed to it themselves. You know, there's, there seems to be in the, uh, groups of people that have, have knowledge of our black history in Ontario. And what they do is they tend to keep it to themselves. They don't share it. So what, what happens is, is, you know, the, you know people grow up, you know, you know, for instance, my son, he grows up and I have to tell him certain things and he doesn't know. And uh, so there's not a lot of sharing in, hmm. of information and that sort of thing. Dennis, on the other hand, he shares a lot of information. Well, let me get Dennis on that. Dennis, yeah. do you agree that there are problems within the community as it relates to the willingness of some to share history or to be invested in promoting history? Definitely, definitely and unfortunately. Um, I have a credo that as long as blacks fight amongst each other, we're not going to succeed in getting equality, jurisprudence, and what we are working towards on a daily basis to obtain. So it's very important for blacks and other communities to work together. Um, you asked me a question about a lot of white individuals who are involved in our process, um, absolutely. Um, I'm from Burlington, the mayor of Burlington is a, a very good ally. Um, pretty well all of Halton executives and mayors and likes of that support us in regards to our black history endeavors. Um, we've been awarded here in Burlington, the first city in the world to acclaim August as Emancipation Month. And along with that, we had two other proclamations uh, all kinds of new information is being developed in regards to helping black and visible noises, BIPOC individuals, and marginalized, quotation mark, individuals in regards to succeeding within this environment. And we can do it, and we're doing it on a daily basis. So I'm quite positive in regards to um, where we're going, but we need each other, especially within our separate communities, to work better together. It takes us away from the success by not doing so. That is a lovely note on which to leave this. I want to thank all of you for appearing on TVO tonight. And uh, I hope, Georgina Alonso, the next time you're on this program, I get to call you Dr. Alonso because you'll have finished your PhD by then. Dennis Scott from the Halton Black History Awareness Society. Rob Green, the singer-songwriter. Uh, glad to be able to put you two cousins in touch once again. Thanks for joining us on TVO tonight. Thank you. Thank you. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.